So I want to talk a little bit about trade-offs. And in many ways, all economics courses, including a course in environmental economics and policy, are about trade-offs, about understanding that if you're doing one thing, if you're spending money on one thing, time on one thing, that you're not doing essentially everything else, all of the other possibilities that are there, right? Attending class, and I have attending in quotes because you're spending some time watching this, this video or participating in this online class, you could be doing all kinds of other things, right? You could be sleeping, yes, you could be sleeping in class like this guy. Uh, you could be eating, you could be traveling, you could be working, you could be studying, you could be watching TV, watching a movie, all, all these things. And the way The Economist looks at it is that you've made a decision, and that decision is to spend time, you know, either watching this video or taking the next quiz or participating in class. And while that's a pretty simple example, and an example that you have to decide you know, or something similar to this every single day of your lives, right? if you're eating Frosted Flakes, you're not eating Cocoa Pebbles. Bad move, anyway. But with environmental and resource problems and questions about how to manage the environment, these kind of important questions involve trade-offs. And one of the, here, this next question that I'm asking, what is the optimal amount of global warming? It may seem kind of odd, or more generally, the kind of question of what's the optimal amount of pollution, right? And, and, and for many people, the knee-jerk answer or reaction is zero. And the optimal amount of pollution seems to be zero. Why would we want any pollution? Well... For the economist, in the economist's eyes, when we're talking about optimal, it's, it's a balancing act, right? So when you're improving the environment or reducing pollution, you get the benefits associated with that. And in this class, we'll talk about, you know, quite in, in detail, you know, what are those benefits? How do economists try to measure those benefits? But the flip side is, is the cost of doing so, right? So if we're talking about global warming, which is the product of climate change from our reliance on fossil fuels, you know, we were in this problem, we started this problem because much of our economy is fueled by fossil fuels, right? Or, or we rely on it. And so all the driving that we do, all the traveling we do, a lot of the food that we produce, the products that we consume and produce, all of this in some way produces greenhouse gas emissions. And so reducing that has a cost to it, right? Um, now, that cost may not be as high as some people think. We can switch to renewables, and all these things are true. But it is also true that we would be giving something up. And where that optimal point is, or the sweet spot, or the efficient level, or the ideal level, how you were to call this or talk about this, is a balancing act between those costs and benefits. And so what, you know, economist idea of optimal may be different from an environmentalist's idea of optimal or a earth scientist's idea of optimal. Typically, we're talking about trying to maximize the benefits minus the cost, right? This cost-benefit analysis or benefit-cost analysis is, you know, you have benefits from some policy or activity the costs and the difference between that that net benefits let's try to get the biggest net benefit and that's the idea of efficiency and in most cases that optimal amount or that efficient amount is not zero pollution it's not zero greenhouse gas emissions it's not zero particulate matter in the year it's not zero sulfur dioxide and and that it's not zero precisely because of these trade-offs, right? That at some point, the costs associated with an incremental improvement in the environment, right, are higher than those incremental benefits or those marginal benefits. And so when an economist says that the optimal amount of pollution is not zero, although it may sound jarring, in most cases, it's true. Another question that has us thinking about 
trade-offs in relation to environmental problems. Uh, who should be responsible for reduce, reducing greenhouse gas emissions? So, so let's say as, as a society, whether that's in this country or in other countries, that we want to address climate change, and we're going to do that through reducing greenhouse gases. Um, then the next question is, well, who should take on that burden? Should the consumer be responsible or the potential consumer responsible to purchase vehicles that are electric or to not consume as much meat or agricultural products that rely heavily on fossil fuels or transportation costs? Is it the polluter that should pay? Is it the electric utility that burns coal to generate steam to produce the electricity? Uh, should they be the ones that that bear that burden? These are normative questions, this is kind of what, what ought to be. Um, but all of these things uh, have to do with trade-offs, right? Um, when we're talking about consumers spending, let's say, more money per kilowatt hour in electricity that's quote unquote green or renewable, then that could that that family has to uh, consider their trade-offs for now that they have a higher cost of kind of meeting those those family needs. And and so this is a moral question, an ethical question, a normative question, uh, and the answer or the appropriate answer that you may come up with, probably different from what I come up with, and those differences in, in the way we think about the world often have to do with the differences how we think about trade-offs. And I should remind us all um, the link between trade-offs and opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is that kind of technical term of what you give up, right? The value of what you give up when, when you make a certain decision. So when, you, when you're sitting here listening to me jabber on, that opportunity cost is kind of the value of that next best opportunity. Whether that was working, you could put an easy monetary value on that, but maybe it's studying, harder to monetize, but still valuable. Maybe it's eating. Maybe it's going to the gym, improving your health, right? And that's the, the opportunity cost is that you've got your trade-offs and what's that value of kind of the, the next best thing that you gave up to do the thing that you chose to do. Um, I don't think, you know, I'll pause this. I'm sure I, you can't hear this. I'm going to post this video on its on its own on, on the website. But what we see here is the back of Corey Knowlton. My question here is, does the way we protect natural resources or preserve natural resources matter? And for many people, it does. And so this is the back of, um, I think he's a Texas a Texan dentist. His name is Corey Knowlton. And he won an auction for $350,000 quite a few years ago now uh, to have the right to hunt and kill a black rhino in Africa. And this is actually called, or what Corey Knowlton is doing, is called conservation hunting. And, and so they have identified a rhino that I think is disruptive to the herd, if you call it the rest of the rhinos herd. Um, and so it's just disruptive in some way, uh, potentially old, um, and for other reasons that kind of elude me now, they've targeted a rhino that they have auctioned off to be hunted and killed. And with that money from the auction, which ended up being $350,000, that money goes into conservation to help protect the rhino population, mostly from poaching. Um, these areas that they live in are, are, are huge, and uh, Namibia doesn't have those resources to uh, enforce compliance with anti-poaching laws, and poaching is the fundamental threat to rhinos, and so this money would go a long way. Um, and so you have this kind of ethical or moral dilemma, does the hunting of the rhino and paying in the western part of the world, somebody who's very well off for the right to kill, you know, one, you know, rhino of an endangered species, but a particular rhino that may be disruptive, uh, to bring about what many would say a greater good of conservation. And some would look at this and say, this is unacceptable on any dimension. 
And so it does matter, right? So sometimes this idea of efficiency that economists talk about and maximizing the net benefits, we, 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 we don't stop to think about it. Sometimes it just matters of how we're implementing that. This is an extreme example, but you hear the same things about taxing pollution or pollution permits that can be traded. People seem to not like, a lot of people seem not like the idea that you can trade the right to pollute. Talk about all these things in the class, but these kind of things matter. Another question related here to, to, to the African elephant is, you know, can we put monetary values? Can we put, you know, dollar values on environmental and natural resources? And for many people, right, they would say that these things are priceless. Of course, trade-offs, right? This is all about trade-offs. Is that, you know, is, is that a reasonable premise to base your decision-making on? And the answer is probably no, right? I just mentioned that to protect an African elephant takes a huge amount of you know, resources to just like protect it, let's say, from, from, from human enemies, but just the amount of resources needed for them to survive, huge amounts of land that we know have other opportunity costs, right? Other opportunities for development or, you know, schools or, villa, you know, homes, um, and manufacturing, right? you know, whatever. In, in some cases that these kind of uh, natural environments just happen to be sitting on, you know, other fossil fuels like oil. Uh, so there are many cases where there are trade-offs for preserving uh, environmental and natural resources. And one of the things that economists help do is try to value these things, not because economists only care about money, not because economists, you know, have to just, you know, kind of suck the life out of everything. It's because to compare apples to apples or to, it's a measuring rod, a common measuring rod, to realize that if we're going to put resources into something, we'd like to know if the benefits of that activity uh, exceed the cost of that activity, right? So if it's preservation, what's it worth to, to keep these elements? And so we have all kinds of different techniques to do so. Um, you can take an entire class on that called the, the Techniques of Environmental Valuation or Cost-Benefit Analysis uh, more generally. Um, but it's just to get you thinking that there are these trade-offs, right? And so sometimes, yeah, we're going to, economists will come up with a value of a view, value of a clean lake, value of protecting a thousand more units of a species, value of protecting one more African elephant. And there are reasons for that and, and they have to do it with the trade-offs. So I think final slide here, I think I've kind of made the point, should an old growth forest be cleared for agriculture development? You know, you have a picture here of um, what used to be an old standing uh, tree uh, and uh, cut down I think for development purposes, it could be just logging that these, these um, there's a huge demand in the global market for these kind of old wood. And, uh, and you know, these market forces, right, when somebody's willing to pay, um, legal or illegal, this is an, uh, an example of a legal logging uh, episode, uh, you know, those forces are strong. Those market forces are strong, even if it's black market forces. And so these are, the, these are the questions that societies have to answer. I mean, you know, what's also interesting is that here in the United States or most of Europe, I mean, we're on a development path that relied on converting natural resources to man-made capital. And the wealth and the prosperity that, that many of us have in, this, in, these, in the Western world is because of that. And now, you know, most of the biological diversity most of the biological diversity on, in the planet is in the developing countries. And to simply ask or expect uh, developing, the developing world to take a different development path or to forego you know, the, the lifestyle, the development path that we have because we've ruined it uh, is, is unethical, unacceptable, and, and, and that tension drives a lot of Kind of international negotiations, international agreements on the environment. And all of these things are trade-offs, right? Every single thing. And so to boil or summarize this, boil it all down, 
economics is all about trade-offs.